speaking on the gains in the tourism sector as we proceed with a responsible phased reopening of tourism in St. Lucia. The motion will continue to be looked over, the first motion, as we resume for the afternoon proceedings. And it, things will continue with the second and third motion. The second motion, be it resolved, that Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow an additional sum of US $5 million by way of credit from the International Development Agents Association for capital expenditure for the health system strengthening project. Be it further resolved that the maximum commitment of charge rate payable on the unwithdrawn financing balance is one half of 1% per annum. The service charges payable on the withdrawn credit balance that is equal to the greater of the sum of three fourths of 1% per annum plus the basic adjustment of the service charge, three fourths of 1% per annum. The loan is repayable in four, 40 years from the date of first disbursement of the loan inclusive of a 10 years grace period. The principal amount of the loan is repayable on each first day of June and first day of December of each year at a rate of 1% commencing on the first day of December 2030 to and including the first day of June 2040. 2% commencing on the first day of December 2040 to and including the first day of June 2060. And the third and final motion being presented in the Honourable House for this sitting today, be it resolved that Parliament authorises the Minister for Finance to guarantee a loan in the amount of Euros five million, sorry, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars from the European Investment Bank by the St. Lucia Development Bank for on lending to micro, small and medium sized enterprises. Be it resolved that the commitment fee is twenty five basis points per annum charge on the unwithdrawn funds as of six months after the signature date. The loan is repayable over a period of 12 years. Okay, we now stop for the entrance of the Speaker of the House. And the commencement of this afternoon's proceedings. Honourable members, please be reminded that the question before the House is that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow an amount of US three million seven hundred and fifty thousand from the Carib Fund Development Fund for the purpose of providing financial assistance to support the implementation of the Village Tourism Initiative by enhancing specified infrastructure and supporting eligible small and medium sized enterprises. Be it further resolved that A, interest is repayable at a rate of 3% per annum on the amount of the loan withdrawn and outstanding from the loan account, and B, the loan is repayable in 48 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each due date of the 40th day of March, 40th day of June, 40th day of September, and the 40th day of December, commencing one on the first due date after the expiry of two years following the date of the disbursement of the loan, or two, on a later due date as specified in writing by the Carib Farm Development Fund. Member for Souffre Constitution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the motion as presented by the Honorable Prime Minister for authorization from Parliament to borrow US $3.75 million from the CARICOM Development Fund in support of village tourism. Mr. Speaker, as the parliamentary representative for the Mecca of Tourism, I see this initiative as an investment in the people and for the people of Soufre, Font and Jacques. As you know, Mr. Speaker, Soufre, amongst many constituencies on the island, have felt the brunt of the, the, the effects, the impact, the negative impacts of COVID-19. 
We have a few hotels that are um, open, Mr. Speaker, but occupancy is not at a level where many of the persons who have been sent home since March are still at home. And therefore, this form of investment in village tourism to diversify the tourism product, not only in Sufre, but throughout the length and breadth of this country, is very welcoming at this point in time, Mr. Speaker. I am also very pleased that Sufre is going to be one of the beneficiaries of the village tourism um, product when it is fully rolled out. Mr. Speaker, this is an opportunity for many of the, the small accommodation uh, properties in Sufre, the small Airbnbs. As you know, Mr. Speaker, many years ago, there was only one particular place in Sufre where you would be getting private villas owned by expats. But right now, for the past couple of years, we've had a major boom in the expansion of Airbnb um, properties in Sufre and Fonte saint jacques And I see this, Mr. Speaker, as very welcoming for those small properties to take advantage of those small, of this money from, um, from SLDB in order to improve on the, on the properties. And by doing so, Mr. Speaker, this I see as creating jobs in the constituency, much needed jobs in the constituency, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is an opportunity to empower the people of Sufra Fon St. Jacques, Mr. Speaker, through this motion. Mr. Speaker, as you know, village tourism has started in Sufra for the past four years. And I'm speaking of projects, infrastructural projects, such as the Hammondwood Beach Project, Mr. Speaker. A project, of course, which the former administration did nothing about when they were in office from 2011 to 2016. And as you know, the Hammondwood Project was completed about um, a year and a half ago, and it has created a major impact on the lives of the people of Super Fonseca, the small entrepreneurs who have been able to take advantage of the infrastructure which we were able to create at the Hammondwood Beach Project, all part of the village tourism concept to add more value to the offerings in Sufre, to the tourism um, sector. Old Trafford, what we have done to Old Trafford, Mr. Speaker, with the market, the bus terminal, and the additional concession booths which are to come on Old Trafford and the um, other restaurant, all of this is part of the village tourism concept which we have unrolled in Sufre. Part of this, um, the other part of the village tourism project, Mr. Speaker, will see the construction of a, of a vending platform at Torai Waterfall, Mr. Speaker. And this is an area which is a very popular attraction site by the tourists to come to this country. And the vendors who are um, vending in that area, earning a living there, they're basically on the road, Mr. Speaker. And it is the intention to, to build a vending platform properly designed so that those vendors can have a proper place to vend the produce, the craft, the souvenirs to the tourists, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I see this as an opportunity for the people of Fonce saint jacques the persons who are part of the Fonce saint jacques Development Committee. Fonce saint jacques Development Committee, Mr. Speaker, is currently putting together an agro-tourism pack with funding from the TF, the Tourism Enhancement Fund, and the JEF, Small Business. And the plan is, Mr. Speaker, for the main, the main um, source of revenue and employment opportunities for the Development Committee and the Agro-Tourism Pact is going to be the Abasso Trail, where um, the Ministry of Forestry, Agriculture and Forestry, will be entering some form of lease agreement with the Development Pact to lease out the Ambassador Trail, and therefore create opportunities for tour guides and vendors, interpretation center, and so on. It is also going to be a project where persons in Fonce Jacques will be able to go into the accommodation um, sector as well, where they'll be able to go into the Airbnbs, the small guest houses, add additional rooms, and so on, onto their properties, so that persons coming down to Sufre, whether it is during the week or the weekend, will have facilities, will have infrastructure in Fonce Jacques, 
where they can spend the night, spend the weekend, and go to Abasso Trail, go to the farms, go do bird watching, and so on. So this, Mr. Speaker, I see as very critical in supporting the people of Fontenjac and the people of Soufre, Mr. Speaker, to improve the standard of living of the constituents of Soufre and Fontenjac, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member for Ancillary Canary spoke of his intentions for the Ancillary um, Village under the Village Tourism um, um, Project, Mr. Speaker. And I must um, tell the Honorable House that the Department of Physical Planning, the architectural section, is working very closely with the member for Ancillary so that we can do a complete redevelopment of the Ancillary waterfront. And I am certainly sure that when this development is completed, Mr. Speaker, Ancillary is going to be fully transformed and maybe even compete with Soufre or Saint Jacques as a tourism destination, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I will not delay too much on this motion. I see this as a very straightforward motion, a motion for the people, a motion to create opportunities for the communities of Soufre, or Saint Jacques, and in Saint Lucia by general. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, I give this motion my unwavering support. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Catrice Office. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I stand to lend my voice to this motion before the House, Mr. Speaker, it is clear that the thinking and the direction in which this government is approaching development, approaching the management of this economy, is clearly the right way to do so. Mr. Speaker, a piece of or this motion before the Honorable House today is very significant. Even if the amount of money involved in the process is not the 40 and 50 million dollars of borrowings that have been done on other occasions, but it is the significance of what is happening and listening to the discussion, the debate, the back and forth, those who claim that they have done so much for the tourism sector. Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, what it boils down to is how it impacts the lives of the ordinary people of this country. And I will highlight a few things that I believe is significant, Mr. Speaker, because we must not lose sight of the peace or, or the motion that is before the House, because it is so easy to get caught up in all of the side discussion and not focus on how this is going to impact the average person who wants a piece of the tourism pie in this country. And Mr. Speaker, I will seek to put things in perspective. As I listened to the members opposite, I noted that the member for Castries is highlighted in his opening statement his support for the bill. I noted that, Mr. Speaker. I also noted the member for Castries South questioning the timing of this borrowing and whether this is the best way that it can be used. If they were singing in my choir, Mr. Speaker, I don't know what tune we would be listening to. Because on one hand, 
when it is convenient, members opposite sing one song. And when it seems that it is something that is beneficial for the people, they sing a different tune because they are not the ones in charge of making this happen. Mr. Speaker, everybody wants to lay claim for what is good. Nobody wants to be responsible for the decisions that appear to be bad. It's not necessarily bad. It appears to be bad. The problem we are having in this Honorable House, Mr. Speaker, is the inconsistency with which pronouncements are made by members opposite. When they in government, they sing one song. Everything is good. When they in opposition, the same things that were good is bad because they're in opposition. And countless examples can be highlighted. But I will note a few of them, Mr. Speaker, to put this debate in context of who has done what for the tourism sector. We are led on this side of the house by a member who members opposite very often label him as the only thing he's concerned about and the only thing he knows about is tourism, conveniently. But today, today, it's a completely different discussion as to who did the transition from tourism from an agricultural-based economy to a tourism-based economy. But I'm going to come to this, Mr. Speaker, because it is important for us to understand how we got to where we are today. There was a time in this country when the economy was based predominantly on agriculture. There was manufacturing and there was tourism. We heard the member for Castries East Lake Lane that the transitioning from agriculture to tourism was led by his government. Now, Mr. Speaker, if that is a transition, then I don't want the members opposite to be in charge of anything that is in transit for me. And let me explain myself, Mr. Speaker. The destruction of the banana industry happened under the watch of the St. Lucia Labor Party. They destroyed the banana industry. And then tourism came in. They claim that tourism did not exist. But you see, Mr. Speaker, the records are there for a reason. And I will go to a, a, a budget debate or a budget speech entitled Stimulating and Reorienting the Economy towards sustained growth. 1998 budget statement, 21st April 1998, by Dr. Kenny D. Anthony, Prime Minister and Minister for Finance of St. Lucia. And what is interesting in this document, in 1998, Increasing rooms. I'm reading on page 89. Presently, there are about 3,500 to 4,000 rooms available in St. Lucia. Government aims in the short term to increase the room stock to 5,000 by the year 2002. So, Mr. Speaker, 
if the member for Castries East will lay claim that the economy transition from agriculture to tourism and was ably led by his administration at that time, of which he was Minister of Tourism, and of which he was relieved of the portfolio for Ministry of Tourism for a short period of time, and was given to Minister Rambali, former representative for Castries Southeast, and then given back to him. I don't know what the machinations were then, but that happened. Mr. Speaker, what is the room stock in St. Lucia in 2020? And if I were to go back to the 10 years of the reign of the St. Lucia Labour Party, from I will just take the first 10 years, from 1997 to 2006 December elections, what was the room stock in St. Lucia? Now, Mr. Speaker, it's amazing, you know. When people come and they speak about what has happened, you know, in this same speech, Mr. Speaker, I heard him say about where the hotels that the Prime Minister, the present Prime Minister, promised. Right here in this is a 500-room hotel in the south of the island. Is there a 500-room hotel in the south of the island? I want to read for you the last paragraph on page 89. Work will begin shortly on an additional 20 suits at Sandals Lato. Club St. Lucia is due for major expansion. Wyndham Morgan Bay is due for expansion. It is expected that the long-awaited 500-room Viewfort Hotel project will commence sometime this year. 1998, Mr. Speaker. 1998. One word of an abundance, no, out of an abundance of caution, Mr. Speaker, I will not venture to state a starting date as I am anxious to avoid misleading the public of St. Lucia. It may be noted, however, that the infrastructure for the supply of electricity at the construction site has been completed. Now, Mr. Speaker, why am I making this point? Because foreign direct investment, as much as a government may encourage and push for it, you do not have any direct impact on whether the people are going to finally roll out the project or not. And even, Mr. Speaker, in the tourism sector, when you have done everything you can do as a country and as a government to make all the incentives and everything available, world situations can change dramatically over a short period of time that can put a damper on any foreign direct investment. Why can't we be honest with the people? All governments, based on the pronouncements, the agreement sign and everything, comes and makes pronouncements on projects that should materialize. And for some reason, Look at how far La Paradis got to. What is it today? But the same people, La Paradis with an 18-hole golf course, Mr. Speaker. And I know you are familiar with the damage that was done to the habitat of protected species in St. Lucia. There are people who have a loud voice today. You have nothing. You have nothing from them when La Paradis was built was being built. But you know what I noted? All of a sudden, the member for Castries East, who was very much involved in La Paradis, all of a sudden, today he comes to Parliament and he recognizes that golf courses don't make money. 
forecasts don't make money. Because Cabot is building a golf course. So all of a sudden, golf courses don't make money. But when they were building the 18-hole golf course in La Parade, it was a good investment. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. This is a matter of you, you cannot be so inconsistent in your pronouncements. I mean, how can we be the leaders of this country? Those who make the policies, those who shape how the policies should be and the future of this country, and then every day, out of convenience, we change our position. Silova la Fashi. That is how Labour Party operates. Out of convenience. Today. To, huh? <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move on. You know, I heard them talk about MRGs and who give in. Well, let me tell them. On page 91 of the same budget speech, as you may recall, the government took a decision to participate in the marketing of the daily direct American Airlines flight from Miami. This will cost $1.5 million, as I have on several occasions outlined the benefits of that decision. When they, and I'm, I'm dealing with the issue of consistency. So when this government agrees to MRGs, it's a crime. When they agree to it, it's the savior for the airline industry. You see, Mr. Speaker, if you cannot be consistent on basic things, how can you govern? So I spoke about the chaos. And Mr. Speaker, the, the claim that the transitioning, this government, what we are doing, in the process is strengthening the ordinary man to become more involved in the tourism industry. And that is important, Mr. Speaker, because tourism is no longer just the big all-inclusive hotel. It's the bed and breakfast arrangements that we have. It's the rural communities, like Wicks in Mac, in my constituency, who has a guest house. And who most of the people who come from Matnik would go and rent a room for a week in there. You would think that a community like Mac is not benefiting from the tourism industry, but it is. Now, Mr. Speaker. I'm not taking away anything from anybody. Both governments have contributed in one way or the other to the growth and development of the tourism sector. But you see, some people only want to claim the good things. So, ça qui légitime yo ka point, ça qui bata, c'est pas yo. Ça l'autre monde. When Musa is speaking, you're not telling him to speak English. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want you, Mr. Speaker, to observe what I am saying here. Because you, Mr. Speaker, sit in this chair. And I know you have to put up with a lot. And so, Mr. Speaker, in trying to grow the tourism industry, this loan facility that is made available through the St. Lucia Development Bank. And Mr. Speaker, I need to remind those who do not know for history that St. Lucia had a development bank before. The same wisdom, in inverted commas, of the Labour Party caused them 
to close the development bank or merge it together with what was the Bank of St. Lucia. Not understanding the basis on which a development bank is established. Because when the development bank was established, when the development bank was established, no, you have to understand new labor and old labor. And I have enough history that I can tell you. But you see, y'all are part of new labor who came in through you, Mr. Speaker, and did not understand what development is all about. And so, Mr. Speaker, you look at what has transpired. So they closed the bank and they merged it. And it would be interesting to see who are the lawyers and what kind of sums they were paid for the merger of the two banks. The United Workers Party coming back into government and understanding the critical role that a development bank plays in the advancement and development of small economies like ours, re-established a development bank. Thank God they did not close it during the last term that they spent in government. And Mr. Speaker, I will not be surprised that day they get into government, they will merge it or close it because they have it of doing that to things that are good for the people of St. Lucia. But but the money going to this bank now, Mr. Speaker, creates avenues for the small business people. So if I look at my constituency, and I can speak to my constituency, and I look at some of the popular places, you look at Glamity, you look at Like It, you look at the areas where people use as a viewing point in there for where they can get local bread made in a drum. You see, Mr. Speaker, some people in this honorable house say they're not eating local bread. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, I guess you have to be bareback. Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, when people who aspire for leadership in this country will make statements like, what attire you have to wear to go and buy bread. Now, Mr. Speaker. Honorable member. Mr. Speaker. Don't, don't get that. Okay. I'm speaking about the local industry. So if we talk about the bread in Tamazo, you ask our taxi drivers, you know how many taxi drivers stop in Tamazo so that the tourists coming to St. Lucia can buy local bread? Mr. Speaker, in the community of Canaries, there was a local bread maker down there, and everybody knew about the Canaries bread. And a lot of tourists and St. Lucians who have visited St. Lucia and are traveling back always stop at Tamazo and buy local bread so that they can take for their family and friends over in the U.S. In their suits. I stop there and buy bread. Mr. Speaker, we are talking about facilities, so maybe, maybe, Mr. Speaker, if I may use it as a reference point, some people believe that when they go to the governor general and wine and dine, they can wear their suit, but the people by the roadside is too low class for them to wear a suit when they go by these people. But you see, Mr. Speaker, it's not the attire, it's the person. So, so if I come to understand what is before me, I want to see some more local bread makers not just targeting the local industry, but targeting the hotel. Mr. Speaker, this morning when I came to the parliament, I said, 
to the persons in the parliament. You all will have to change the menu. Because some people will not eat bread in suits. And every, when I went there, there was local bread on the menu. So I assume that no parliamentarian should be able to eat bread because all of us have suits today. You see, Mr. Speaker, they want me to move on. That is how ridiculous some of the statements we hear. That is how they are. But, but Mr. Speaker. Continue, Honorable Member. Mr. Continue. Speaker. Whatever I say, whatever I say, Mr. Speaker, I don't need. There are some things that cannot be defended. And that statement cannot be defended. Mr. Speaker, I go anywhere with my... Honorable suit. Member, don't be distracted. Okay, thank you. Mr. Speaker, the other area of concern, I mean, Mr. Speaker, have free guava trees at my home. Mm -mm. A free government. When you look at the things we produce from guava, guava jam is one of the best tasting things in St. Lucia. Not just for the local market. Now, Mr. Speaker, sometimes it's good to demonstrate. So let me show you. Mr. Speaker, these are from my guava trees in my yard. <laughs> and the salad I ate this morning before I came to Parliament was made of guava. Unlike some people who say, I ain't in no guava. <laughs> but you see, Mr. Speaker, that is what... <laughs> Honorable. Honorable member. Let's go home. Let's Honorable go home. members. Better for Labri, those better than that. <laughs> Honorable Member. Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member, since you're on a light and note, or we appear to be on a light and note. I'm, I'm moving on. Mr. Are members, no, are members saying that your governors are both in? Continue, Honorable Member. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in St. Lucia, just by way of passing, let me inform members that for the 30th anniversary of St. Lucia's independence, I bought 1,000 plants that I distributed to the schools and communities throughout my constituency. And most of these are fruit-bearing trees that today you can pass around the constituency and you can see, I think Minister Ezekiel and myself at the time, planted a guava tree in forest here by the school and a golden apple tree and both of them bear. You see, Mr. Speaker, what we produce, and, and that is what part of this money, part of this bill, is geared towards, Mr. Speaker, reaching the person who make the cassava on the way to Canary. So the tourists stop them. Some of them need to enhance their businesses. Because it is not just about big business in tourism. It is what... And some of these people, Mr. Speaker, they cannot go to the regular banks and get a loan to be able to advance their dream of owning something that depends on the tourism sector. But you see, the members opposite, Mr. Speaker, when the member speaks about who's for the Malawi and who's for the ordinary people and who transitioned the industry, the banana industry facilitated everybody. I can identify one half farmer on the other side there. <laughs> he owned the farm, but he didn't work the farm. The member for you for South. You for South. Mr. Speaker. He had a farm. Okay? But he was not the one working the farm. So I call him a half farmer. I was a whole farmer. And I see another whole farmer here. Mr. Speaker, when the banana industry was working, I used to sell 150 boxes a fortnight. 
I worked the farm. I understood the ins and outs of the industry and the challenges that it faced. When the banana industry saw its demise, which began with the coupe pa coupe strikes in 1995 onward, Mr. Speaker, we saw the transitioning of the economy. The economy was forced into transition. There was not the right marriage between agriculture and tourism. And it was when the present Prime Minister was Minister of Tourism and the then Minister of Agriculture representative for Babonu. When they came together and deliberated on the matter and looked at how we can marry all of the things within the agricultural sector with the tourism sector and the more you grew the tourism sector the more potential there was for growth in the agricultural sector because you are now bringing the market to St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, bananas was green gold. Since those days, Mr. Speaker, we have not seen the full transition. And I'm happy to be from the community of Forest there. And I've said it in the house before. If you look at when the then UWP government spoke about diversification from an overly dependent agricultural sector. They were not speaking about the destruction of the agricultural sector. And Mr. Speaker, I'm trying to make this point to understand what has happened to this economy in what was supposed to be in transition. Mr. Speaker, the people of my community diversified. Some went into equipment, some went into buses, some went into taxis. And if you look at the public transport sector, you might get minibus drivers from Forest Lane, Grozy Lane, Bad Nim, Viewport, all of the area, because there was a big diversification drive. Then you, you look at those who went into tourism transport, and maybe it is the, the community with the single largest fleet of public buses within the tourism sector. And also those who diversified into equipment throughout the constituency of Castro in South East. Mr. Speaker, we have realized that the full benefits of the tourism industry is not felt by the number of persons who are benefiting from the agricultural sector. And now what we are attempting to do with some of these new initiatives, village tourism. Now, Mr. Speaker, those who want to call it heritage tourism, those who want to call it village tourism, however you look at it, the communities are beginning to benefit more and more from the tourism sector. It's unfortunate what COVID has caused, COVID-19. But as any other thing in any other industry, the world will ride this way. And things will go back to a level of normalcy. And we will continue to navigate on the right path. You see, Mr. Speaker, I heard members complain about how much was given to them when they were in op as opposition members. The member for Castro South. Member for Castro South, if I got one quarter of what you got as you in opposition, when I was in opposition, I would be happy. And Mr. Speaker, I need to make that point. 15 forms that used to be given to MPs for primary school children where you would fill out the form and you would go to the RC school from my district to go and collect some supplies for school. When I was in opposition, 
these 15 forms were withheld from me even after I had the name of the students. I had to go and find the money to give to these parents so that they could help their children through school. Today I had the members. Yes, it has been brought in this house before and I have touched it before. It has never been true. He had explained to me that the member for library didn't get his either, so that should be comfort to me. That's what he explained to me. So, so you, see, you see, Mr. Speaker, convenience, again, convenience. When he was Minister of Infrastructure, through you, Mr. Speaker, same again, he used to give 60000 for the stimulus. I said to them, give me a quarter of what I used to give you all and I will be happy. Not even that. But you see, Mr. Speaker, you cannot govern in one manner. And when you're sitting on the opposite side, you don't want nothing you did to come back to you. Now, you see me, Mr. Speaker? I've told them. You can call it what you want. I've made my position clear. Show me everything you gave to me, and I'm giving you twice what you gave to me. And I still stand on this. You see, Mr. Speaker, the members opposite, when you all made the 15 school children cry, did I come and cry to you all? Honorable member. So, Mr. Speaker, I move on. When I give things in my constituency, and this alone, Mr. Speaker, this alone is not going to discriminate against people based on which political party they support. That is why it is going to the development bank. And once you meet the requirements, the loans officer will be the one to determine who gets the loan. You see, Mr. Speaker, there's nothing you can say. There's nothing you can say to the desperation that is on the other side there. But the fact remains, Mr. Speaker, that what we have done speaks for itself. What is the priority? The member for Castro South kept on asking, is that the priority now? When we were fixing the road, now look, look, at, look at the inconsistencies again. Well, you all are fixing roads. Marigold Road should be fixed. But when we were making the decision, Marigo and Basse Joseph. And he even says that the people of Basse Joseph intend to take action to get their voices heard. For the same road, they say that should not be the priority. So what is it? He all said fixing roads should not be a priority at this point in time. Cancel the Taiwanese money. Don't do the roads. Don't do the... Of course, Basse Joseph Road will be fixed and Marigo Road will be fixed. Because you see, we're not fixing the road for you. We're fixing the road for the people of the constituency. I've always known that. You see, Mr. Speaker, I move on. I want to say that I'm proud of the representation that ancillary has today. Finally, finally, we have a situation where it is not lip service that is paid to the people of ancillary, but real tangible development is coming to the village of ancillary. Mr. Speaker, it is very clear to me, very clear, that the Prime Minister in highlighting that we are going to target three key communities for the village tourism project, and these will be used as the model to be replicated in other communities. I don't represent a village. I represent a rural community. But I, too, would be looking at what can be done within my constituency to benefit the persons within the tourism industry. 
Mr. Speaker, every vehicle that comes from the airport, 90% of them pass through the community of Bexham. Until there's another road, that's the route. We have to find a way. And under the tourism package that we are looking at, through the CDP project, we are building a market in Bexham that is going to cater for the persons within the tourism sector who keep on driving to and from the area without stopping. We are going to create an environment for them to stop. We have seen, they said, what did we do in Sufre under the tourism projects that we were doing? Mr. Speaker, we started the Hummingbird Beach project, which was at an advanced stage to be completed. The Labour Party sat in office for five years and refused to finish the project. Thanks to the representation of the member for Sufre Forsesha. Go and look at the Hummingbird Beach project. Look at the number of young people in the community who have become entrepreneurs themselves, running their own businesses and employing other people to work with them. That is visionary leadership. If the members opposite had any vision, they would not have stopped a project like that. They would have continued. And so, Mr. Speaker, some of these people are struggling because of the COVID environment in which we are in. Some of them need a little boost financially to keep their businesses afloat. And that is what this loan facility, we are borrowing the money as the government, we are putting it into the development bank so that persons can go and get money from there to continue their business. That is responsible governance. That is governance that trust the people's ability. The people don't want handouts in this country. People come to my office and they tell me, look here, c'est Give me a little job. Let me work for something so that I can have the pride that I earn the dollar that I have. Another handout from a politician. You know, Mr. Speaker, I look at the areas within my space. I mentioned a few, we are doing the Bexar Market, Glamity like it. You have places like Bread Masters, where all kinds of cakes are baked in there. Bread, special bread. So it's not just the Tamazo local bread that we are talking about. Some of these people would need a little boost. We are looking at the Forestia Nature Trail. We are looking at improving on the Sarot River Lime area, which boundaries Ansaray Canaries to Castries Southeast, and formalize the arrangement so that you can have better facilities to accommodate the activities that are revenue generating for the people. Mr. Speaker, it is to see an opportunity and to be able to capitalize on how I can use it. And these are the opportunities that this government is creating even amidst the COVID crisis. We are finding innovative ways to help our people weather the worst part of this COVID crisis. So, Mr. Speaker, members opposite can talk. But when I look at the plans for the ancillary waterfront, I applaud the member for ancillary canneries, for his development vision for the community, the village of ancillary. And as highlighted by the member for Castro South, Marigo is a very beautiful place, exceptionally beautiful. And I believe that Marigot deserves a better road so that the people in there can capitalize better on the tourism product and the beauty. Just being able to sell a postcard 
of Marigo means a lot. You see, Mr. Speaker, we are not going to look at it and say, this is in the opposition constituent. But you know, talk about the Marigold. I knew he would go there. I knew he would go there. Talking about the Marigold Road and the Basse Joseph Road. For the last 20 years, 10 years of John Odlum, the, and then 10 years of Robert Lewis. And the road is in the same condition that it was ours. Look the member here. You see, Mr. Speaker, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, they represent their constituency and they do nothing in their constituency. For two decades, they have not fixed the road in Basse Joseph or in Marigo. But they come to this government. But you see, we are the government of the people, Mr. Speaker. And we are going to fix the road in the areas that they have not fixed the road. Because that's our job. They expect us to fix the roads and we will fix the roads. I can calculate for you, you know, 33 million in library. I still have to go and do the Marjomel Road in Labri. Continue. Mr. Speaker. You see, the mem Mr. Speaker, I don't wish to be where the members opposite are, you know. I know where their confidence is. Their confidence is in the ability of this government to deliver on all the things that they could not have done. That is where their confidence is. And I'm happy, I'm happy to see my opponents having so much confidence in the United Workers' Party government. Mr. Speaker, I move on. So, when I look at what the member is doing in ancillary, we've spoken about there's the fish fry, but Marigo, ancillary is a stone throw away from Marigo. You just come around the curve and you into the... And ancillary is actually very beautiful from the seaside looking in. And it is to capitalize on that. Now, Mr. Speaker, I know Denry and Mikud and Labri and all of the other villages, canneries, would be looking forward to what village tourism is going to bring to them. But you see, this bill today, Mr. Speaker, goes way beyond what the government itself is doing to enhance the infrastructure in these areas and is creating a platform so that the visionary young people within the communities, those who have an eye for development, will be able to find an avenue to raise much needed revenue to capitalize on gaining from the tourism sector. That is what this bill is about, Mr. Speaker. It's not all the other things that we are saying. And unlike them, Mr. Speaker, unlike them, I can, read re I can read statements where they said, unless things come to ministers, it, it's not going to be approved for things in communities. When we send the money to the development bank, Mr. Speaker, the development bank will make the decision. They will not ask you if you labor or if you flubber or if you don't belong to no party. Once your project is good and you qualify, you will get the ball. That is what leadership, that is what governance is about, Mr. Speaker. That's what representation of the people is all about, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, we are managing transition. We are not destroying one industry for another industry, as was done by the St. Lucia Labour Party when they were in government. Mr. Speaker, I move on. It's been a long and hard transition. We are fixing the system so that the people can benefit, the local people. And I heard the member talk about what happened in January and the project that went on there. 
the Land Rover, yes. And, and the building, the, the old Lakai police station. Members opposite continue to use information out of convenience without being truthful. Everybody knows that whether it is EU grant funds or whether it is an EU loan, there are specific requirements that must be met for the expenditure of these resources. And what they are doing, Mr. Speaker, is disingenuous to the people and the well-being of St. Lucia in the future. Because all of these things are played worldwide, internationally. And when donor agencies like the EU would listen to what the members say, as if the government of the day just came and took the EU money and just spent it as they wanted. I know better than that. I know the member. I know the member for Mikud South and Prime Minister tried his best to redirect this in a proper manner to get the desired result. But it was set already. Now they want to claim. They want to claim the project at VG. But it would be interesting to know, Mr. Speaker, who had negotiated the terms and conditions for the use of the EU money. Because I can tell you, the EU money, I found EU money on the table when I came <laughs> to do projects in Prale and in Bans. Two roads to be done. Grant money. Three months to go. They could not use the grant money. We would have lost the money at the end of the three months coming into government. But you see, grant money, they couldn't do what they wanted with it. So they didn't pay attention. We, we tried to speed ahead with the project. And we said, do what you can. I said, even though it's the drains alone, you can do, do it. Because that's not a loan that we have to pay back. That's grant money. The people were so impressed when they saw what was done in Prale by the contractor that they gave us an extension of six months that allow us to finish the Banslaho Road and the road in Prale. You see, Mr. Speaker, members opposite, must, we can play our politics, but do not bring these institutions that give us grant funding into disrepute by the manner, the careless and reckless manner in which the statements are made. If you want to say that was a poorly conceived project, that was not a project that my government would have done, you're free to say that. But to give the impression that we took the EU money and we squandered it is disingenuous. Huh? I know. I know they started it. But you see, Mr. Speaker, convenience again. So when they started it, it was the best thing since sliced bread. But now, Mr. Speaker, I move on. And so I say, for the NAO's office, the National Authorizing Officer, the EU rules apply across the board for any expenditure that you are going to make. And I want to assure everybody in the international community that whether this government or the opposition when they were in government, the rules have always been followed when it comes to the expenditure of resources gained outside of Central and I'm not going to be like them, Mr. Speaker, to castigate just to score cheap political points. That does not benefit us. Because when you find yourself on the other side, you have more problems because it is the pattern that you have set that you now have to deal with. And so, Mr. Speaker, members opposite must stop this. If the people want you, they will vote for you. You don't have to come and mislead the House to gain a vote. Let your record speak for itself in the constituency and let the people vote for you on that basis. 
you are coming to this honorable house and you are saying that it's for politics that we are doing this. Politics is around the corner. So they come in. So we knew COVID was going to come in 2020. We knew that we would have put measures in place. And, and it's through the generosity of these organizations that we are getting these funds at concessional rates. So you telling me that we, we are such geniuses that we were able to contemplate or to prophetically predict that COVID-19 would be here in 2020 and we would need that money. So we started the process of negotiating to be implemented. When the same members not too long ago, Mr. Speaker, they were in the house when they were laying claim to the water project in January. I don't care who lay claim to the project. It, the money didn't come from any of our pockets to do it. But you know what they said? You know how long it takes to implement projects and we were doing this and we were doing that. I'm not self-righteous, I'm truthful. That's the difference between you and me. I'm truthful. Not self, Mr. Speaker, I'm not self-righteous, I'm truthful. And he needs to learn some of that. Mr. Speaker, so when we come to the Honorable House, we are not coming and pass bills because of them. We will be here after the next election on this side of the house. We are making the bed that we are going to lie down on. Honorable member, you have five minutes in which to complete. Thank you, Mr. Time. Speaker. And so, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Continue, Honorable Member. So, so, Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the people of my constituency, any one of them who has a vision of a project in the tourism sector, that these funds would become available so that they can access and they can grow their business. Because, Mr. Speaker, in this environment, we have spoken about empowerment of the people. And the best place to empower people is in their pockets. Well, on l'argent, et que ça dépense une manière ou vle, ou pas de boire des politiciens, make an order of drinks for me. But I want when I walk into my constituency, that my people not asking me for a drink, but they offering me a drink because we have empowered them to be able to earn their own money. Is what I drinking. So what is not a drink is the same thing. You do it hot bread, you do it guava. So what is not a drink? A bottle of water. A bottle of water is more expensive than a soft drink. Honourable member. Mr. Speaker. In closing, in closing, I'll give you one. The member for Castries is not it in Guava. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, there are opportunities. In every crisis, there are opportunities. And out of this COVID crisis, there are rising many opportunities. But it takes good visionary leadership to create the enabling environment for these things to happen. And I believe that this small loan that will be available through the St. Lucia Development Bank will go a long way in helping more persons to be part of those who would earn from the tourism sector. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for V Fort Knox.
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me thank you once again for this opportunity to contribute to yet another resolution, this time the Village Tourism Initiative by enhancing specified infrastructure and supporting eligible small and medium-sized enterprises. I sat there, Mr. Speaker, and listened to many exchanges and jabs about guavas or guava and bread and who had suits and who didn't have suits. And I listened to the member for Castry Southeast when he spoke so glowingly about the many people who will get opportunities. Mr. Speaker, the record of this government will show that the people who really got opportunities are the few multi-millionaires who manage most of the millions and secure the chunks for themselves, the friends, family, and undeserving foreigners of this government. Mr. Speaker, I sat and listened to members opposite addressing this matter of village tourism, and I could not believe, Mr. Speaker, that they were speaking at a time when all around the world, all development agencies, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, so many experts are saying to us that we need to, to take a new direction in tourism. They were there talking, Mr. Speaker, as if nothing has happened in the world and that they are going to build things all over the country, build things on the roadside so that the tourists will stop and do the very same things that they were talking about prior to COVID. Mr. Speaker, this is a government without any vision, without the ability to adjust to crises in the world, as we have seen, Mr. Speaker. And this, their responses to this, to this resolution here today prove that. Mr. Speaker, I, I waited in vain for the minister with responsibility for tourism. And I waited for him to explain to us how this initiative would really impact all of these people whom he said the initiative will impact. But again, business as usual. Throwing quarrels to members opposite. And not a focus, as the member for Castry South said, about the thousands of St. Lucian workers who are out of a job today as a result of the negative impacts of COVID and how this initiative will assist them. And I will show you in a while, Mr. Speaker, that so many international agencies are pleading with governments to focus on the workers today, these workers who are out of a job because of COVID-19 impacts. And today, I'm here in the parliament listening to these, um, on, to these members opposite as if nothing has happened in the world. And they will build things all over the place to cause tourists to come. It's as if, Mr. Speaker, nobody opposite has explained or understood that tourists don't just come to your country simply because you build this and you build that and that they are going to come. All of the indicators show that it's going to take some time, Mr. Speaker, before the, to the tourists come back in the way that, that they did before. When I listen to the Prime Minister time and time again, he speaks about the revenues coming back, as if things will come back to normal. I listened to the member for Castry Southeast, and he said the same thing. To the effect that things will come back the same way they were, every crisis, Every crisis, the world comes back to normal and things change. All of the research demonstrates, Mr. Speaker, that when we have had major crises in the world, things never come back to the same. They never come back to the way they were. Never. World War II, the 1920s pandemic, everything, every major crisis we have had in the world has caused major shifts in the economies of the world, not just in the small islands, but in the economies of the world. And I have not heard any argument here today which connects the impacts of COVID-19, our tourism in St. Lucia, and indeed the Caribbean, the source markets, the United States, England, Europe, and so on, what's happening over there, and how it, it connects to these initiatives that the members speak so glowingly of. Business as usual. Mr. Speaker, these people, these members are not ready. They have not demonstrated to the people of St. Lucia 
how they are going to manage this economy, and they are not speaking to the thousands of people who are out of work. Mr. Speaker, I am here to speak on this resolution, and I want to relate it to the thousands of people who are out of work. Those people who don't know after this month whether they will be getting money to send their children to school. Those people who, had, who are tourism workers or workers in the, in the industry who had to pay registration fees. These are the people I want to talk about. Those born and bred St. Lucians. Those people who are grown by the St. Lucian e economy and the St. Lucian way of life. Mr. Speaker, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development indicates that the global tourism standstill due to COVID-19 has cost the, the sector dearly, especially in countries like ours, Mr. Speaker, that's heavily reliant on, on tourism. And they speak about how this new tourism could be rebuilt. And that is the kind of thing I'm interested in. How will this new tourism be rebuilt? It is not just about building things as, as the members indicate. This pandemic gave a blow to many employment opportunities and to, and to people who are working in tourism in St. Lucia. And the echo, Mr. Speaker, as you well imagine, is worldwide. They are saying to us, Mr. Speaker, that over 100 million jobs are at risk. And only on August 25th, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, they were indicating to the world that this is going to have profound impacts and all countries must do things differently. What about St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker? How many jobs of St. Lucians have been lost? Is it 16,000? Is it 17,000? Is it 12,000? How many families have been impacted? And we are here in this house talking about Gova and people being Gova to the house as if this is some kind of puppy show. How many families today do not know how they are sending their children to school tomorrow? Families who, work, who are people who worked in, in, the, in, in the tourism industry, Mr. Speaker. And what are the policy responses by this government? This is an urgent situation, Mr. Speaker. Lanyan Shai Munki is appeared to have a as a hotel for tourism. Agnilou Vinicia, Mr. Speaker, ka parle an le lajan ki gouvernman ka y prete pou ede moun ki vle wi bati za fe tourism. Me sa man ka di a tout patou ou li wan la te a. Tout go organizasyon ka di ki tout gouvernman ni pou gade za fe tourism la di fe wan. Se pa men bagay tourism, tourism, tourism. Sa tout sel mwetan. I did not hear, Mr. Speaker, anybody talking about how these things will connect to livelihoods and how they're going to connect to food security. It's as if all the tourists will return. Exayo kadia, Mr. Speaker, tourism pakai manye iteye. Mem si tourists viye, se tourists la pakai viye a mem manye ayote viye. Kosa gouvernement ni pou pon a difouan chime. Ek nou paka wè gouvernement ka pon a difouan chime. Ako di se mem bagay. Yo vini a kaila ka pala bo gouyav evek pen, tout kalte bay kon sa, ek lani yo tan moun ki pa ka travay. Ki sa gouvernement ese pou fe evek se moun sa la, ki pasab ki manye yo ka vwe isyo l'ekol demen, moun ki de ka travay an hotel. Kome sa moun pa ka travay, ek se pen ek gouyav yo ka vin pala bo an house la, jodi a misi speaker. There are so many of my constituents who work at Coconut Bay, and they are not working, Mr. Speaker. They need to find out what are the new policy responses. How is their government going to support them and to ensure that they can survive? Mr. Speaker, the outlook is very gloomy. And the reality is this. We have a prime minister who continues to make pronouncements all the time. In his presentation today, the prime minister indicated that by March 2021, revenues should be, should be back. By March 2021. And that is seven months from now. 
In other words, Mr. Speaker, it's indicating to us that the revenues should recover by March 2021. Seven months from now, the recordings are there, Mr. Speaker. If that's not what he said, if he said it in another language, then let me know. If he spoke another language, seven months from now, March 2021 is seven months from now. But here is what the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development is saying. They published in a report recently in September of this year, this month, that because of a protracted break in international tourism, a protracted break of eight months could raise worldwide losses to $2.2 trillion. And they're saying a 12-month break can take it to $3.3 trillion, which is 4.2% of, of global GDP. Now, Mr. Speaker, I don't know how the Prime Minister get, got it that in St. Lucia, by March, seven months from now, our revenues will return. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, Mr. Speaker. Being real with the people of St. Lucia. And saying to the, they're saying to the people of St. Lucia, we are going to do all of these things. We are going to put a jetty over there and so on. And that's going to make your life better. We're in a situation, Mr. Speaker, where tourism, as we know it, will never be the same again. But this government is living in a dreamland. They promise you all sorts of things and expect you to believe them because the Prime Minister says so. And so by March of next year, our revenues will be back and things will be okay. The same United Nations agency, Mr. Speaker, and I quote them, they say fears are bound. In other words, people are afraid. So it's only in St. Lucia the government is very bold and everything will turn to magic. And that's the kind of thing, Mr. Speaker, that causes crashes in economies. Because in St. Lucia, everything is fine. The revenues will return. L'argent touriste est vie. So, moun pa ni pou konsene, parce que le gouvernement ka y mette ti shop pa la, ti shop pa de la, avec touriste ka y vin gen. Tout moun ka di, tourism pa ka y men man yay te. Et le gouvernement sa ka kontine, mette ze y adan, pou yen tourism sa la, pli gros pa se y te mette avant although we are in a crisis situation. Mr. Speaker, the United Nations is saying to us that look what's happening in Europe. The same travel res restrictions that were lifted for summer are now coming back. And this, Mr. Speaker, this resolution is obviously predicated up upon the fact that in our source, upon the, the notion, the belief, that, it, that our source markets will rebound. And the, the United Nations is saying to us that over there they are afraid, fears abound, Mr. Speaker, that in Europe travel restrictions are back. You see what's happening in England. But no, this government is burying its head in the sun because it's going to get a loan and they are going to boast to people, nuka fe this bow, nuka fe that bow, in a dream world, instead of facing the facts and creating policies where people can eat and people can survive. Mr. Speaker, the United Nations again, urging governments to protect workers. In fact, in the document, it actually says people first. People first. It's in the document, in the United Nations document. And that was indicated, Mr. Speaker, by the Secretary General, Mokisha Kituyu. And she, she insisted that in this environment, governments must put people first, advising governments to assist current tourism enterprises. There's a whole discussion, Mr. Speaker, on what should happen on the blue economy. A lady called Donna Bertirelli, Mr. Speaker, spoke about it, advising governments to take a new direction but not this government. And so many opportunities, this document is, is saying, yes, you can rebuild community, you can do activities that will help the communities and benefit the environment. But what's important, Mr. Speaker, is to focus on these people who are suffering. If the, the member for ancillary countries and the minister for tourism has these ideas. I did not hear him present them in this debate. 
And if he has ideas for the blue economy and people who are doing CMOS, for example, like in our constituency, the Opicon CMOS farmers are doing very well. I didn't hear him speak about this, Mr. Speaker. There are a few things, Mr. Speaker, that must be done. And I'm not hearing it from this government. I'm not hearing this government talking about a resilient, inclusive strategy to change what's happening with to what will happen with tourism and change how our people will benefit. I'm not hearing this government talking about how, in specific ways, they are going to mit mitigate the negative impacts of COVID-19 on, on various groups, on women, on youth. They said generally Viewfort is part of it. I don't know if the member for Viewfort South has details, but I don't know what parts of Viewfort. I have not heard any consultations with, with groups in our area, like the Yelp Environment Group, which is developing a waterfall in the Bellevue Grace area. I have not heard consultations with the Laurels groups and the, and the people who fry fish at Opicon. I have not heard the consultations with the Turtle Watchers on Sandy Beach. And how is it that this government plans, Mr. Speaker, to boost com competitiveness in the new tourism that is coming? And what is it this government is doing, Mr. Speaker, to promote domestic tourism? Maybe the Minister for Tourism can answer. Is there, is there a plan, part of it, to promote digital skills in tourism? To foster growth and sustainability, Mr. Speaker. In other words, Mr. Speaker, the focus of this government seems to be on putting infrastructure in place, as the member for Castries South has said, putting infrastructure in place and hoping, and hoping that in seven months, the tourists will return. All of the evidence and all of the research demonstrates that any government who thinks like that is a backward government, Mr. Speaker. They are not reading what is happening internationally, and they are not following the advice of all experts who are saying that we need a different tourism, a more inclusive tourism. But building structures around don't necessarily give you an inclusive tourism. And you know, Mr. Speaker, what is interesting? The new tourism that is coming, the new tourism that is coming abhors the behavior of governments like this one. The new kind of tourism, the research shows, is a kind of tourism which, which, which is attracted to heritage. And what is this government about? That your credit, your heritage is like, is your credit rating. You think, you think the, the new kind of tourism doesn't know about that? The new tourism that we are, we are thinking about is a tourism that appreciates people and their local assets, their beaches. But there is a government that is hell-bent on giving away our beaches. They had Sandy Beach as part of the DSH deal. And that's the new kind of tourism that's coming. And even up to now, Mr. Speaker, they have plans for developments that will take these developments right up to the edge of Sandy Beach. So how does that, how do the policies of this government match the new kind of tourism that is coming? It's a more sensitive tourism, which focuses on your natural assets. It's not a mass tourism. And this government's thinking is still based on a mass tourism. You heard him talk about transportation and all the tourists stopping in that place and stopping over there and doing this and that. So what the government is, 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 is speaking about is not based in reality of, the, of what's, up, what's going to come in the future, Mr. Speaker. This is a government that has caused to be used our NIC funds, our pensioners, to cause a multimillionaire to get access to it and to desecrate the burial grounds of our ancestors. But this government is the kind of government that is the, the anti 
of the new tourism that is coming. So this government does not match the new tourism that is coming. All of the actions, Mr. Speaker, demonstrate that they are not in sync with the new tourism. They don't know what's coming. And therefore, I agree with the member for Castries South and the member for Castries South East who say that is electionary. Because that has the thinking that went into, in, into this does not adjust to the reality of today, Mr. Speaker. This is the same government during its tenure where a DCA changed decisions so that there is a, a, a maleng bobo on Gopiton, Mr. Speaker. The same government. And this is the same government that continues to insist that it doesn't really care about what you think and about what you say. They're going to let people bray. They're going to let the jackasses bray. So they don't care if what you say. That is not the new tourism that's coming. It's a tourism of, of inclusivity, a tourism that, that, that focuses on, on, on how people treat how people treat their natural assets, as, as I said before, and a tourism that's based on partnerships of, with local people and a tourism that's based on individual and group relationships. This government is not like that at all. So, Mr. Speaker, while there are many opportunities within our constituencies for heritage tourism and for the development of sites, this government has not explained how the new tourism will fit into that. So we too have areas that people visit. We have had our local tourism happening with our waterfalls and so on in View Fort North. We too have had people visiting us internally because of what we do with our cultural activities. Although their surrogates put, like to say, the only thing I can do is to speak part one and play drums. That's what they say. But I understand why they'll say that. Because I'm a product of St. Lucia. I'm proud of the fact that I speak part one and play drums, Mr. Speaker. I'm a product of St. Lucia. I'm not a product of any other place. I'm a product of St. Lucia. Good noise, just like good trouble. Good noise, like good trouble. Good noise is important. Mr. Speaker. So the opportunities that are there, Mr. Speaker, this government has not demonstrated that it's ever been interested in it. At Savans Bay in View Fort North, for example, we have developed facilities where work was not continued, Mr. Speaker. But thankfully, our people are using these facilities to grow their CMOS and to have local touristic activities right there and then. A more intimate kind of tourism. And so, Mr. Speaker, while <coughs> the intention of this to cause people to participate in tourism is not a bad intention, it's very clear that this government is not doing this correctly. I can predict, Mr. Speaker, that all of these structures that they're going to build will be there for a long time before any level of normalcy returns to, the, to, to tourism. And I can say to you that the prediction of the Prime Minister that by March of next year, his revenues will return, or the, or the country's revenues will return, is a prediction that I have a lot of difficulty with. And if he's basing his policies on that prediction, Mr. Speaker, it does not look like he's following what's happening globally. And his ideas, and the, this government's ideas of development, of tourism, are ideas that alienate our people, Mr. Speaker. Alienate our people. So there are more incentives, more likability projects for people who come to St. Lucia during this COVID pandemic from countries where you have the most COVID in the world. But St. Lucians themselves will soon get imposed upon them some of the most draconian measures that are not in a state of emergency. You see how this government is, is two-faced, Mr. Speaker? And that's the kind of thing that is happening. So, Mr. Speaker, I trust 
that since the loan will be in the SLDB, that there's no political interference. And I trust, Mr. Speaker, and I hope that this government, in fashioning the bill, as the Minister for Tourism said, takes into consideration the new realities with tourism in St. Lucia. It's another, as the member for Castries is said, another flashing mirror. Just like they said, they remove VAT. Just like they said, they're going to build seven hotels. Just like they said, we'll have a pearl of the Caribbean and no ghetto in Beaufort. They call us ghetto people, ghetto people, and showed all kinds of pictures and all skyscrapers. Just like that, Mr. Speaker, I believe this is an election project. I do hope people benefit from it because it is the people of St. Lucia who have to repay this loan, and this government is not acting, Mr. Speaker, like they understand what's happening to tourism in the world, and they have not demonstrated to us the new vision and how the new tourism will be. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Labra. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are asked to approve a resolution that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow an amount of U.S. $3,750,000 from the CARICOM Development Fund for the purpose of providing financial assistance to support the implementation of the Village Tourism Initiative by enhancing specified infrastructure and supporting eligible small and medium-sized enterprises. Mr. Speaker, I wish to state from the outset that the constituency of Labri, Oji, and I fully support Village Tourism as an initiative. I also take great pride, Mr. Speaker, in reminding this Honorable House that the Labour Party was indeed the pioneer in developing village tourism. However, Mr. Speaker, there is no doubt in my mind that this administration, despite all the noise, despite them getting all hot and sweaty about this debate in this House, this whole borrowing and posturing has more to do with election window dressing than about any serious effort to borrow to implement village tourism to benefit the various communities in St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, given the dull complexion of the nation's finances, when people are suffering, this is clearly not the time for the Prime Minister and Minister for Finance to play games with serious initiatives like village tourism, Mr. Speaker. It is inopportune at this time to incur additional debt for playing games with the minds of the people of this country. And Mr. Speaker, 
the leader of the opposition was right when he took us down memory lane and quoted the Prime Minister's comments. And he went as far back as 2007. But this term as Prime Minister, in 2017, 2018, he spoke about tourism and developing plans. The same speech he gave here this morning. So, Mr. Speaker, 2018, 2019, the same story. 2019, 2020, the same story. 2020, 2021, the same story. Let's examine. Let's, let's expose the words to the sunlight of pragmatism. Mr. Speaker, I am sure we'll, you will agree with the leader of the opposition that the Minister for Finance has repeated himself year after year. That is four budget years with different flowery language, but the end result is the same. Absolutely nothing. Mr. Speaker, the Minister for Finance also stated that funding is coming from the OECS Tourism Competitiveness Project. I see, however, that we are seeking a loan from the CARICOM Development Fund for the project. Mr. Speaker, I checked the estimates for 2020 2021 and note that there is a total project cost for village tourism of 12 million. $975,290, of which are measly $173,127 has been spent to date. In the estimates, an amount of $1,042,688 has been allocated, of which $742,688 is from a grant from the CARICOM Development Fund and $300,000 is from bonds. Under the OECS Tourism Competitiveness Project, an amount of $3,950,612 is approved. We do not have, however, information on the amount that is allocated to village tourism from that amount. It is clear, however, that this new loan from the CARICOM Development Fund and I emphasize loan, Mr. Speaker, is not featured in the budget for 2020-2021. The total amount of this loan is US $3,750,000 or EC $10,125,000. Mr. Speaker, only a few months ago, in one sitting of parliament, we were asked to approve a total of US $75 $700,000 or $204,390,000 in the house. And none of those projects of borrowing were included in the budget that was recently passed, Mr. Speaker. In the 2017-2018 budget estimates, the project cost for village tourism was $2,710,000. And this was to come from grant funding from the CARICOM Development Fund. In 2018-2019, the project cost for village tourism was reduced substantially to $324,000. And again, the source of funding was grants from the CDF. In 2019-2020, the total project cost was reduced further to $164,654 with source of funds being CDF. So, Mr. Speaker, for the period 2017, 2018 to 2019, 2020, there was zero expenditure for village tourism. And that is a government that prides itself as a government that is interested in tourism and building the tourism product and diversifying. For four years, you all did nothing about, about village tourism. You all were more interested in other things like horses and cabots and, and all sorts of things that will not build the economy of this country. And then you all come and attack the opposition that has delivered in village tourism, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, this shows clearly that this government is not serious about village tourism. Four years of bluff and fluff and nothing to show. 
Mr. Speaker, I need to ask the Minister for Finance about the status of the establishment of the company Village Tourism Inc. and the preparation of the legislation for village tourism. I guess it needs another four years to establish the company and, of course, to properly put legislation in place. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues are correct in saying that elections are fast approaching and the government is attempting to do something quickly before the elections. But Mr. Speaker, I ask, should the opposition join the government in this bluff borrowing where they have given lip service to, to village tourism for over four years while the people are suffering and need income support in this government's self-imposed fiscal crisis made worse by COVID-19? And at this juncture, Mr. Speaker, I must give careful and sensible treatment to this fiscal mess. And therefore, we need to cast the borrowing in the context of the self-imposed fiscal mess made worse by COVID-19. At the sitting of Parliament on July 21, 2020, the Minister for Finance presented a resolution, namely the Coronavirus Disease 2019 Emergency response loan to Parliament to authorize the borrowing of U.S. $10.7 million from the Caribbean Development Bank. The purpose of the loan was to use the funds to pay our debt service obligations to the bank for a period of one year from October 1st, 2020 to September 30th, 2021. As I indicated in my previous statement to the House, the direct analogy of this loan was to use the loan funds to pay off the debt obligations of another loan. This was to give the government of St. Lucia fiscal space to finance critical health-related expenditure and to promote economic and social recovery. Yeah. At that sitting, I requested that the Minister for Finance present an update to Parliament on the fiscal performance of the country as it would be important for Parliament to receive information on the actual performance to date of the major critical fiscal variables, including revenue, expenditure, borrowing requirement and debt, as well as the forecast for the remainder of the year. This information was requested, Mr. Speaker, in light of some major warning signals that were flashing on the fiscal dashboard, namely an increase in payables and the request to ask civil servants to take bonds as part payment of the salary. The Minister for Finance has to date not provided this information to Parliament, yet he has come to the House again to request borrowing for another loan from the CARICOM Development Fund in the amount of $3,750,000 for financing what has been called the Village Tourism Initiative. It appears that the Minister for Finance wishes Parliament to make decisions in the absence of critical information to guide decision making. It is to be noted that while the Minister for Finance has not given Parliament an update on the fiscal performance, he was on a, a recent panel discussion facilitated by the Clinton Global Initiative presenting economic and fiscal information on St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, you would have expected that the august body of parliament would have received this information before it was disseminated to third parties. The Minister for Finance revealed that our tax revenues had dropped by 50% and that revenue collections would be done by $600 million. He further stated that our debt to GDP ratio would increase from 59% in 2019 to 85%. Mr. Speaker, in the absence of critical information, I had forecasted that the debt to GDP ratio would have increased to 84.7% in 2020. Mr. Speaker, this is alarming. And the siren should have been ringing so loudly to caution us to cur curtail our borrowing. It is important, Mr. Speaker, that Parliament be aware that our debt to GDP ratio is calculated on the disbursed debt and not on the full loan. Mr. Speaker, can you imagine what our debt to GDP ratio will be 
when all of the loans contracted by this government are fully disbursed, I can, and it will almost be as large as our GDP. It will be in the vicinity of 100%. Mr. Speaker, we have not heard of any sound debt management strategy that this government is pursuing in this complex and fluid world situation. The government has instead continued on its merry way of expansionary construction projects, thereby increasing expenditure and debt. And Mr. Speaker, this expenditure, as is evident by the drastic reduction in the, in the tax collections, has not had the desired impact on the economy and employment. But I'd also like to refute a statement made by the Minister for Finance at that panel discussion. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, that as a result of his policies, he was able to bring the debt to GDP to 59%. Mr. Speaker, this is completely untrue and I will prove it. According to the 2015 Economic and Social Review, the public debt to GDP ratio was 75.4%. In 2016, in adopting the 2008 system of national accounts, a number of changes were made to the GDP, resulting in a major increase in GDP at market price figures. In fact, GDP at market prices for 2015 increased by 15.2% from $3.86 billion to $4.45 billion. As a result, the debt to GDP for 2015 was automatically reduced from 75.4% to 65.4%, Mr. Speaker. That's no magic by this government. A further rebasing exercise took place in 2019, resulting in a further major increase in GDP. According to the Economic and Social Review for 2019, our debt to GDP ratio fell even further to 61.5%. So, Mr. Speaker, with the stroke of a pen. As a result of these two rebasing exercises, our debt to GDP for the year 2015 fell from 75.4% to 61.5%. So it is rather unfortunate that the Minister for Finance would say that he was responsible for reducing the debt to GDP ratio. But Mr. Speaker, I wish to return to a major revelation made by the Minister for Finance in his presentation at Clinton Global Initiative, he said that there will be a shortfall of 600 million in tax revenues. He also stated that expenditures have increased because of COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, this has major implications for the budget in terms of how the $600 million hole in the budget is going to be closed. So Mr. Speaker, we are moving into the third quarter of the budget year, and the Minister for Finance has not yet seen it fit to come to Parliament to present a supplementary budget to show how he proposes to restructure the budget to address the reduction in taxes and increases in expenditure. The information that is coming out is that the budget is in a mess and monies received and programmed for certain projects have already been utilized for cash flow purposes. Mr. Speaker, while I understand the concept of money being fungible, this only applies in cases where you expect to receive this money in the future. Mr. Speaker, we do not expect to receive this $600 million in tax revenue, and therefore, there is a shortfall in the financing of the budget by that quantum. I wish to again make an appeal to the Minister of Finance to present a report to Parliament on the state of the nation's finances as it appears that the government is operating outside of the legal framework of the approved estimates of revenue and expenditure. At this stage, Mr. Speaker, I am of the view that we should not engage in bluff borrowing at this time for something as important as village tourism. Mr. Speaker, our people are hurting so much with thousands unemployed and more have since joined them since July as many students have graduated from secondary tertiary and university levels of education. Mr. Speaker, the priority at this time must be in providing income support to the poor, the vulnerable and unemployed people of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, during the course of the presentation 
of the member for Unslurry and Race. He accused this government of doing things for big business. For big business, Mr. Speaker. How insens insensitive we were to the poor people of the country. I wish to just caution, Mr. Speaker. And even in this very sitting, I scrutinize statutory instrument 119, 133, and 138. One dealing with Fresh Start, one dealing with Vision Express, and the other one, Bryce and Company. And in this particular statutory instrument, Mr. Speaker, I noticed that we are giving 100% waiver of income tax for a period of three years, commencing from the 1st of March 2020 and terminating on the 28th of February 2023. Three years to fresh start. At a time when revenues are down and people are hurting, the question is, Mr. Speaker, what is the rationale? And I'm hoping that when the Prime Minister is going to be summing up, he will provide an explanation for that. When people are hurting, and Prestat is one of the companies, I must admit, have been very, very lucky to have a lot of direct awards going its way. And it's doing better than a number of others. And so at all times, Mr. Speaker, I will support the government, whether it's this one or a Labour Party government, assisting local business. But I am afraid, Mr. Speaker, that we may be going outside of the law on this one, and I would like the legal experts to really check it out. Because it indicates the approved service of Fresh Start is, and I quote, civil works relating to the design, construction, and maintenance of the physical and naturally built environment, including works such as roads, bridges, canals, dams, and buildings, are declared to be an approved service of Fresh Start Construction Company Limited. Mr. Speaker, whereas I can understand that civil works relating to engineering design can be classified as an approved service in keeping with Schedule 1A of the Fiscal Incentives Act No. 30 of 2019, I am at a loss as to how civil works relating to the construction and maintenance of the physical and naturally built environment to include works such as roads, bridges, canals, dams, and buildings can be classified as an approved service. In Schedule 1A of the Fiscal Incentives Act, the approved services are listed. In that list, it said engineering, architectural, and integrated engineering and services are you included. So, Mr. Speaker, I am, I am getting, I am getting there. Remember, you get in. I'm getting there. I, I made this allusion to Fresh Start in the context, one, of the, the, the tax break. Maybe the Prime Minister, like I said, will deal with that. But also, Mr. Speaker, I want us, when we give incentives, we, we are actually operating within the parameters of the law. And it seems that on this one, we need to double check that we are doing the right thing and giving the incentives under the right authority. Now, whilst Fresh Start, and that's the point again, Mr. Speaker, received break on a number of vehicles, 100%, those who qualified, like Vision Express and Bryce and on the manufacturing, are getting 75%. So we need to reconcile that in the context of what we are doing at this juncture in time, that we are maneuvering within the parameters of the law, and at the same time, we are not giving unnecessary breaks, while a number of St. Lucians are suffering and would need our support, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, with those brief remarks, I yield. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, um, and I thank members for a very uh, wide debate, and I think a lot has been said, Mr. Speaker, about village tourism. 
one thing I would certainly see that we've all collectively concluded here is that in building a tourism product moving forward, it has to be more indigenous, it has to be more authentic, and it's one that must give an opportunity for St. Lucians to participate on a wider, a wider level. I was very grateful, the member from Castries East, Mr. Speaker, for remembering that um, I had spoken about village tourism all the way back in 2007 when I was a Minister of Tourism. So I think that this idea that some members on the opposite side have attempted to say that this is a, an election ploy, hopefully we can put that to rest. That this is a long-term view that we have had as a government, and clearly in starting off as the Minister of Tourism, being new to the party, um, I'm very grateful that time has passed, Mr. Speaker, and that my party has embraced these ideas full-heartedly. And so while we were in government in 2007, the then Prime Minister, Sir John, bought into that vision, Mr. Speaker. We have the evidence of it in that for the first time that a government had committed $50 million towards the marketing of tourism. And he made a commitment for three years to fund tourism for $50 million. That was almost a doubling of what had been given to tourism at any other stage, Mr. Speaker. And I remember before getting into politics directly, had the opportunity to tour the island with Sir John. I would say there are two members on the opposite side that also when they were in government, I was very honored that they gave me the privilege and the opportunity to also to take them around, not only in St. Lucia, but internationally to see tourism. I was very honored. In fact, I'm always willing to share my ideas. I don't believe that they are in any way owned by me. In fact, the idea of village tourism is currently in existence, Mr. Speaker, in Europe. It's the oldest form of tourism. In the United States, South Beach is village tourism. So it's not something I can say to you that there's a genius behind me. It was certainly in traveling and seeing firsthand and realizing that there was an opportunity to translate that here. And my, 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 my tour with Sir John, I remember specifically going through Groselay, Mr. Speaker, the village of Groselay. And he was lamenting the fact that here was Groselay in the middle of this development. Kappa State and Rodney Bay and the marina and all these areas around it and every area else seemed to have developed. But Groselet seemed to be constrained. And despite the success of the Friday night fet, street fed, it hadn't broadened to make a deeper impact in the community. And I remember saying to him, you know, Mr. Mr. Sir John, that if you notice in Groselet, all the buildings that are on the waterfront, the back of the buildings face the water. Every single one of them. So when you leave the, the, that bank of the St. Lucia building, and you're going down the road, all the buildings on the left-hand side, all the buildings face the road. When you got to the waterfront in Groselet itself, in fact, there's a hotel that's right next to the banana split. The balconies actually face the roadside, and the bathrooms face the ocean. Banana Split itself was actually literally built into the ocean, Mr. Speaker. And the back wall in the ocean had no windows, no balcony. And the back side of, of, of Groselet was the front street, Bay Street. And he walked around and he was, he was shocked because that is factual. And I also said, we went to different places, that St. Lucians are not given a fair opportunity to participate in tourism, Mr. Speaker. 
And how is that? Is it solutions were struggling to identify appropriate land? And then when they got the land, it was raw land and they would have to put significant amount of infrastructure to invest in it. And the more infrastructure you have to invest in it, the more rooms you need to have. And the more rooms you have, the more need money you require. And so you saw a lot of small properties that they were taking a piece of land wherever they could get it. But the desire to get into the industry was so strong that they attempted. And sadly, we saw a lot of properties fail. The other thing, Mr. Speaker, is we saw persons who were transitioning from either being a great chef or being a very good marketing person or somebody who was even in banking transitioning into the industry and thinking that the business was simpler, borrowing money, and more often than not, Mr. Speaker, when they borrowed money from the banks, the banks never lent them the money on the business acumen of, of, of what they were building. They, in fact, had to put up collateral that was outside of the hotel, whether it be their personal homes, family guarantees, but it was certainly not being lent money on the ability of the business to be able to repay. And sadly, over the years, many of us have met many of those solutions who have attempted to get into the industry and have lost. The minister is correct. He, he started an, a, a policy, a program called Heritage Tourism. I applaud the program program was talking about helping the attractions and developing sites throughout the island. In fact, it had a management team. But sadly, that project failed. It actually went into bankruptcy. Um, and persons benefited from the initial incentives provided to get those attractions off the ground, but quickly started to rely upon themselves to continue those businesses. And, and we've had that discussion before. There's a fundamental difference between village tourism and heritage tourism. Village tourism is looking at the broader context of tourism in an indigenous basis. And so we've realized that in order to allow some of these small properties to be more successful, we have to have more support around them. So if you're going to have a guest house in the heart of Groselet Village, Mr. Speaker, there needs to be ordinances. Can't be having people playing loud music until 3 o'clock in the morning. Stray dogs all over the place. What time are the restaurants going to open up early in the morning? The state of the sidewalks, the collection of garbage, the maintenance and preservation of the architecture of the village in that it has its own character. And then we also realize that each village needs to have its own marquee attraction, something that gives people a reason to want to go there. We've seen, Mr. Speaker, that Europeans are prepared to come and stay longer in St. Lucia and are also prepared to go and stay in multiple destinations within St. Lucia. We've already seen it with Soufrier and Rodney Bay. But we believe that if we can create and develop these marquee attractions, so I take canneries as an example, the old church and the waterfall become two good reasons if they're, if, if they're done right to cause people to spend a couple of nights in canneries, to stay in Choiselle. And in fact, I admire the innovation of many of the persons that I'm seeing in the Choiselle because they have found a, a unique thing, which is to combine agriculture with tourism. The ability of having some guest houses on my farm and realizing that people are willing to come down and stay on, at, my, at my room and enjoy working the farm and actually living as a, a solution farmer for a period of time. What does that mean, Mr. Speaker? Is that the farmer now has found a way to complement his revenue, earning US dollars with no added work because it's right on his property. Probably a very good example on a bigger scale is Fondue, who went out and bought old indigenous homes and placed them on a cocoa factory, not on a beach, 
away from the beach. So what we've realized is that in order for village tourism to generally take root, or I should say, in order for solutions to participate in tourism in a more meaningful way, there has to be an investment in the infrastructure of these villages that make them like the reception area of a hotel and each of the different accommodations or different room categories. The difference is if you go to Sandals, there's one person. So Stuart goes around and determines the landscaping, hires everybody else. In village tourism, it's collective. And so the town council has to play a critical role in managing it. We've also realized that, sadly, the money that's required for persons to get in, involved in the industry, the banks don't want to lend them money. The banks find them to be unsafe loans. And thirdly, that the expertise that's required to make a good small hotel work is lacking. So having a 20-room hotel, as an example, that's selling for $85 a night, Mr. Speaker, does not generate enough money. So the ability of now providing those kinds of, of investors with management, accounting systems, with uh, health and safety standards, centralized purchasing, in a franchise system, all of a sudden, Mr. Speaker, and that's given to them for free. So by becoming a member of Village Tourism, which will be the next piece of legislation that's going to come, we're creating an incubator. We want to see them succeed. Would I have liked to have seen every single thing start at the same time? Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. But that's unrealistic. As the money has come, even pre-COVID, and even during COVID is even worse, in terms of the timing of receiving the cash and when the, the commitments come from the board of directors, because exactly what the members on the opposite side said, everybody is cognizant of COVID. So even the loans that were approved pre-COVID, boards have had to go back and reconsider them and make a determination as to whether they want to continue. It's not new. This is too big of an issue to believe that it's business as usual. So let me put to rest the member from Beaufort North, I have no idea where he got the statement to say, I said that revenues will be back by the March 31st. Lunacy. The best prognosis is that we've said it's going to take three years in order to get back. What we've said is that by the end of next year, what we're hoping to do is to minimize the gap as much as possible. And the only way to do that is to see if we can now push harder to get tourism to return quicker than the, what we're prognosing. That's all. But to say that there's any indications out there that the global economy or even St. Lucia's economy is going to return by March 31st to pre-COVID levels is, is insanity. And certainly none, none of the plans that we have are predicated on that premise. The premise that we have is that we would see a return to revenues by 2023 is when we're hoping to see revenues come back and we're hoping that to see tourism arrivals and even if you get tourism arrivals it may not be at the same expenditure level we have no idea when tourists are going to be able to freely go around the country and we're going to see all of our attractions come back to where they are so mrs St mr speaker in terms of a tourism plan as to where we're going it's it's the inconsistency of the argument on the other side that keeps me confused. So, as pointed out by the member from Castry Southeast, at one point you supported golf, now you're saying you don't support golf. Um, and I'll be happy to share a, a, an article that came out from Bloomberg in June 11, 2020. Golf enjoys a U.S. boom that's making tea time scarce. Because that's what happened. Post-COVID, it is a game that actually does not conflict with COVID um, policies and protocols. And in coming back, one of the things that golf had struggled with was young persons. We've also seen with Cabot that, in fact, 
their sales have accelerated. Why? Because people are realizing they can work remotely. So having a second home that they may use more frequently is becoming now a reality. That's what's happened. And, par and part of that's that diversification. You know, there was a, a villa, not the one we're talking about now in the PMA, but another one when we were in government in 2008, in which the members on the opposite side were also up in arms uh, about building in the pizza management area, etc. by an Italian family. The villa has been built. You would go there, you wouldn't even see it. So after it was built and all of the vegetation grew back, you can't see it. But guess what? There's a young man working there, and he gets paid more money than a school principal to manage the villa. And we're seeing new jobs being created by these wealthy persons who have their secondary home here. Our CIP program, our residency program, our, our headquarters act, and now COVID have all enhanced the, the viability and of that market coming to St. Lucia in droves. And guess what? Village tourism supports it. Because a person living in a villa now has a multitude of different places he or she can go to. And the idea of creating the North-South Highway in that person now can get to those villages much faster and enjoy what people are enjoying in Groselay. Because we've seen that success. How many other countries in the Caribbean have emulated our Groselay night Friday night? Mr. Speaker, this bill is just one element of village tourism. And I'm again happy that the member from Castries East continues to talk about how many times we've brought it up. So it's about infrastructure. So with the programs with the, the Taiwanese, the grant funds, $10 million is being spent in the infrastructure development of Soufrere, Ancillary, and in um, Groselais. And the goal is next term to expand the program to the other villages. But anybody who wants to question the validity and the good sense of village tourism just needs to go to Sufre and see Hummingbird Beach Project. A project that I don't want to re re reiterate what was being said, but the members on the opposite side abandoned. You know, this is why I'm saying to you, it's very difficult for me to take with any level of sincerity, Mr. Speaker, this idea they care about the people and this what it put people first. Where were the bathrooms? Hummingbird Beach was being built for the people in Soufrere in order they can, have, they, can have, they can have businesses. All of those. We don't do the STEP program like you did anymore. So Mr. Speaker, that's when you were genuine. The beach facilities in VG, the beach facilities in Groselais. And the intention is now to fix up the facilities in Ansaray and eventually now to expand it to Canaries and to Labry and to Choiselle. All of this is to now enhance the opportunity for locals because I see so many young St. Lucians doing so well in the industry, but one of the things is they want to own their own business. What's further evidence that we are sincere about this, Mr. Speaker? It's what we're doing on Sandy Beach, where we're taking 100 acres of land, subdividing it, putting in infrastructure, water, roads, sewage and a master plan with enhanced incentives to allow solutions to be able to buy 10,000 square feet or 10,000 square feet and to build on the entire lot and what the concrete road becomes a boardwalk and now you remain the total beach remains public and on that public beach we have washroom facilities and small goal facilities and other recreational facilities that they can all use Mr. Speaker That's about empowering people. That's about putting people first. And so yes, the friends of the people, the friends of ours, are who? The citizens of St. Lucia. That's who our friends are. And yes, foreigners are welcome here to bring their money, to invest, to grow our economy, and to provide investment that we ourselves cannot do. It's not about getting cars, taking benefits for yourselves illegally. 
It's not about wealthy billionaires who invest nothing in the country and open up secret accounts that nobody on the members on the other side even speak about, Mr. Speaker. A member from Castro South said there was a joint account with uh, Ambassador Jafali. Repeatedly, we ask, where was the account? Who was the account name in? How much money was in the account? Maybe I should have asked the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Maybe he would have known. I don't know. And he says the account was audited. You go to the director of audit, there's no such account. So where is it? I don't know. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, I mean, maybe he needs to answer, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Speaker, needs to answer some of those questions. But when we talk about credibility, we talk about commitment, we talk about a clear vision, village tourism is not a pipe dream. Village tourism is a reality. This is just one component of it, Mr. Speaker. Members on the other side also talked about debt and revenue. I would like to say to the members at, at the next House sitting, I believe, Madam Director, that we will be presenting a paper on um, debt management and our overall debt management strategy, because it's critical. But we also have to lace it in the reality. The reality is some of the thresholds, i.e. 60% debt to GDP, may not be realistic. How do you all of a sudden, nobody anticipated COVID, you're having to borrow almost $400 million, $500 million in order just to fund your budget because of lost revenues. That's increased our debt to GDP by 20%. So therefore, we have to work, and we're working with the World Bank and with the IMF and CDB to come up with a very clear strategy, which we will bring to this House, and we will articulate in this House, because it's real. And if anyone took the time to listen to my presentation at the UN, these were the things that we were articulating for, particularly not just for St. Lucia, but for small island developing states. So Mr. Speaker, on that note, um, I'm hopeful that members on the opposite side will take the lead of their leader and enthusiastically endorse this project. This project is a significant uh, component of village tourism. It's simply providing loan financing for those persons who want to take advantage of the infrastructure, the in incentives that the Minister of Commerce and the Minister of Tourism have been putting together and will soon be complemented by the Village Tourism Incorporated Act. And what that act will do is now give a new incentive facility for small hotels, not including just incentives, but also technical support, free technical support and management support to help improve the viability of their industry. So on that point, Mr. Speaker, I thank you very much. Honorable members, the question is that Parliament authorizes the Minister of Finance to borrow an amount of U.S. $3,750,000 from the CARICOM Development Fund for the purpose of providing financial assistance to support the implementation of the Village Tourism Initiative by enhancing specified infrastructure and supporting eligible small and medium-sized enterprises. And be it further resolved that A, interest is repayable at a rate of 3% per annum on the amount of the loan withdrawn and outstanding from the loan account, and B, the loan is repayable in 48 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each due date of the 40th day of March, 40th day of June, 40th day of September, and the 40th day of December, commencing one on the first due date after the expiry of two years following the date of the disbursement of the loan, or two, on a later due date as specified in writing by the CARICOM Development Fund. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Mr. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave for, of the House to suspend Standing Order 9, which is the order of business, to allow the House to deal with the COVID-19 bill at this stage of the sitting. Honorable Members, the question is that Standing Order 9 be suspended.
to allow the Honorable Prime Minister to deal with COVID-19 bail at this stage of the sitting. Or the nine would have to continue at this present time with the result with the motion and thereafter to deal with bills in the current state of the order. So it's asking for us now to suspend the, the stipulated order and uh, move into dealing with bills before before we complete. The COVID-19 bill. Which one, Mr. Speaker? Because we have two. Yeah, well, you could just get it. Well, but, Mr. Okay. Speaker, I know that, but are there any changes? And that, that came at 455. That's a very important bill, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, we should. Mr. Honorable Speaker, um, Leader of the Mr. Speaker, what um, I want to propose is that this bill has not been properly ventilated, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I think in the interest of the, the Prime Minister should at least for, for one listen to some people who the SLHTA and the Bar Association, I say the, SL, the SLHTA first because they are the ones who have spoken, who they are the ones who, 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 who the bill seems to impact on the most and the SLHTA have asked for the bill to be honorable members, let, let me hear them. Mr. Speaker, that's how they are, Mr. Speaker. You know, they, they don't want you to speak, Mr. Speaker. They are in charge there. Let me, Mr. Speaker, the SLHTA has asked that this bill be deferred. I would, and I would think the Bar Association also, I think the government should defer it at least for some level of discussion. Um, if it is only the opposition, I understand that behavior. But it's not only the opposition, other people have asked for his deferral. So, um, I don't know whether the Prime Minister should, would consider before it so for the for discussion. Member for Vifort now, Vifort South, sorry. Mr. Speaker, you are a practicing lawyer, a, a former magistrate, and I think all of us have reason to respect your views on interpretation of various rules of the House. I have some difficulty, Mr. Speaker, with your interpretation of Order 9, and I don't know, Mr. Speaker, whether you might not want to adjourn and to reflect on your interpretation of Order 9. Maybe you had had an opportunity to be advised that this would have been the procedure, and uh, you have formed a view on it. If so, I think um, you owe it to us to, to, to give us an explanation. And I'm sorry that if you thought I was being perhaps a little irritating if I'd asked you what is Order 9 say. Um, I now have a copy. It says, unless the House otherwise directs, the business of each sitting day shall be transacted in the following order. Now, my interpretation of this is that unless the House directs on another occasion, not in the course, not in the course of a debate, if the intention was that this happens in the course of the debate, it could have said, it would have said, unless the House, other unless the House otherwise directs in the course of a sitting, it doesn't say that, Mr. Speaker. What it means is this that. The, the House can reorder this in advance, but not in the course of a sitting like this, Mr. Speaker. 
And I'm sure that you can consult the appropriate rules to get the interpretation to this order. And that is why I raise the, the, the question, because it is clear, unless the House otherwise directs the business of each sitting day shall be transacted in the following order. The House has already directed. It has directed by virtue of a fixed, of a very, a fixed order paper. So now you are saying that in the middle of this debate you can do it. I don't know, Mr. Speaker. I would advise perhaps you may need to take a, a short break and convince yourself that you are interpreting this correctly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable member, um, honorable members, uh, I beg for ten minutes. I'll be back. The que honorable members, I put a question that the House do stand suspended for the next ten minutes, and I'll put a question as long as many as are of the House opinion say aye. aye, as many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. House is suspended for ten minutes.